Hello, my name is Adam Roberts and I'm your instructor. And I would like to take a minute and welcome you to FRSC 1161 Fire Service Safety and Loss Control. We are currently using Don Zimmerman's second edition Firefighter Safety and Survival for our techs. Even though this is not a live lecture, you can ask me questions anytime by phone or email. My email is aroberts at athenstech.edu and the phone number is 706-357-0162. Also, there are virtual chat sessions if you want to talk about issues and questions in the text and that will be done at Blackboard Collaborate and you can look at the calendar in the lessons tab and get those dates and times where I'll be available in Blackboard Collaborate to assist you. All right, let's get started with chapter one. Okay, our objectives for chapter one. First, define culture. Two, discuss the need for cultural change in the fire service relating to safety. Three, discuss the aspects of a safety culture within fire and emergency services. Four, discuss the gaps between a safety culture and the existing culture of emergency services. Five, discuss why change occurs in an organization. Six, list examples of how an organization can use change to its advantage. Seven, List some of the reasons people resist change and give examples in the fire and emergency service. List examples of other industries that have used leadership, management, and supervision to develop components of a safety culture. And finally, discuss ways to use the success of other industries as a catalyst for advocating a safety culture within fire and emergency services. Now, it's very important that you use these objectives as a tool to help make sure that you get all the valuable information out of the text to ensure that you are properly prepared for the upcoming examinations and quizzes, as well as homework assignments. Change is something that is not uncommon in the fire service, and neither is safety. Though, personally, I believe we don't do quite a, a good enough job, and we'll talk about that more throughout this chapter and text in regards to safety. So, for the past 200 years, the United States has gone through several significant changes, such as on September 11, 2001, we watched an attack that would change the world forever uh, in regards to the World Trade Center. The attack moved terrorism from the 6 o'clock news to our front windshield and it put emergency responders on the front line. With that being said, there was a drive and a push to try to prevent this tragedy from happening again and really focusing more on safety. Two main reasons listed in this text for current change to our safety culture and one again is 9-11 and the tragedy that happened uh, with that and other terrorist type events but the second and to me this is a really big one is as a culture as a service as an entity we in the fire service have really failed to decrease our line of duty deaths and we'll talk about the uh, many different reasons for the line of duty deaths as a whole. But this is definitely something that needs to be addressed. The change to a safety culture involves weaving theories of risk management into everything we do. And if we look in the folder for this week, you'll see Gilbert Graham, and he has a great video on risk management and ideas with it. So I definitely want you guys to watch that. As with all change in the fire service, 
there is a resistance to it. You can even look back in history and see how we we have fault change from the time of, uh, say, man-drawn fire pumps or engines to horse-drawn. Uh, we don't do well with change, but you know we have to be proactive and find a good balance. And when we look at a good balance between tradition and being proactive and being safety, one such debate is the positive pressure ventilation where one side of the spectrum you have folks that say positive pressure uh, positive pressure ventilation is a bad thing um, due to the fact it can push fire into void spaces make it more intense most fires today are uh, oxygen driven as opposed to fuel driven and, and this is just going to make things you know 100 times worse and then on the other side of the spectrum, you have people that say, hey, you know, if it's done with a hose line, a coordinated tack, and good ventilation, the positive pressure is a good thing because it introduces fresh air in the environment, improves visibility, uh, and reduces heat, making it easier to do the job in a better environment for any possible uh, victims that may in, be in said structure. So the question is, which side is right? Um, to ventilate or not to ventilate and with anything the answer probably is somewhere in the middle between the two and there are a whole host of, of issues like that now in the fire service where they're debating whether or not to keep what we've done versus new trends and safety and it is up to us as an entity and agency going forward and individuals to try to balance that and improve our mindset on being a good safety culture and backing up with sound judgment, science, and education. When we look at change, there are two types of change. Change that is reactive and change that is proactive. And we'll go more deeply in detail into each, but essentially reactive change is the result of some incident and proactive change is looking on the horizon and making a change or doing something different prior to it becoming an issue unfortunately change a lot of times comes at a cost meaning it, it's reactive and case in point is for example dot department of transportation and let's say you have a small town where a major highway goes through and there's no red light there and the town has often been an advocate of putting a red light there due to the uh, numbers of minor accidents and DOT is not going to do that because you know again it costs money to put out a red light and other interesting circumstances and factors and they have to look at the data because they can't afford to put a red light at every intersection that crosses certain major highways so eventually they'll get enough data and that data usually is in the form of fatalities and accidents and, and once it makes a big enough excuse the expression stink or wave then something gets done and again that's an excellent example of being reactive rather than proactive Another reason why we kind of resist change is um, it's human nature and we say it, it's not going to happen to me or it's not going to happen to us. And, you know, that goes back to the whole fire safety problem. Um, but again, that's another text and another discussion. So why are we proactive? You know, proactive approaches basically says, hey, there's a risk. We see it. It could happen. And let's do something about it. Insurance agencies have been doing this for a long period of time. They look at a piece of property or something. They measure the risk. And if they don't see uh, proactive measures in place, they either, A, won't insure it, uh, the property or whatever the case may be, or the person, or B, they're going to charge them higher rates. 
Let's look at an example in the text. You have a child that is riding a bicycle or a dirt bike, shall we say, if I remember correctly, and they get in an accident. They were not wearing a helmet, and they suffer a debilitating head injury. Now, moving forward with the younger brother, it's fair to say that the parents are going to be reactive in the sense of saying that either A, we're going to get rid of that dirt bike altogether, or B, we're going to force the younger sibling to wear a helmet and all protective equipment at all times. So why weren't they proactive to begin with? You know, again, hey, it's it's not going to happen to me. Um, it's fine. I had one when I, when I was a kid or, you know, whatever the case may be, or it may be even cost. Of course, a lot of times with change, we don't do well unless it's either A, forced upon us, or by some sort of mandate by law, or B, you know, again, it's something that's reactive. And in the fire service, we are very reactive. Uh, you would think we would be proactive, but uh, really, we're, we're not. Case in point, in 2006 or seven, uh, the federal government basically laid out the line saying, hey, if you work on the right-of-way of federally funded highway system and you want grant money, you need to make sure that your people and equipment have a certain minimum amount of approved, ANSI-approved, reflective striping on their person and their equipment. And the only exception to that would be, uh, say, firefighters actively participating in hazmat incidences or an active fire. So since that mandate came down, we all knew that there was a danger on these interstates and roadways, but why did we not put more reflective striping on the trucks or on our persons? And we didn't do anything till we were told to do it um, with uh, the good old purse strings. And that's when you start seeing all the reflective striping on the back of these fire trucks and ambulances, so forth and so on. If we look at any other high risk agency or occupation, uh, they are big time proactive. And the good example in the text they use is building the underground tunnel under the um, English Channel between England and France. And they were very proactive in doing safety updates and ensuring that they plan, planned again, contingencies. Because obviously any mistake would either A, cause the work to collapse, the water to come rushing in, tunnels uh, to go, and people to get seriously hurt or injured. So they were very, very proactive uh, to the point of... Um, almost being extremely anal, and I find it interesting that with this this tunnel that costs you know millions upon millions of dollars, uh, it was not funded by the government. It was funded by private stakeholders in the form of banks that required the work to be done and done safely and effectively. Um, just because of the cost of failure, as well as the cost of the project. Now most injuries caused during non-emergency activities are totally preventable in the fire service. And that's one thing we really need to work on. There you know should be no reason why people get injured in a training event. So during our non-emergency evolutions we need to make sure we plan, plan again, and ensure all safety measures are in place and make sure we work on continuing to update our SOPs. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time in emergency situations, but if we train well enough and practice contingency plans on emergency scenes, it's really gonna help with the safety factors. With the reason for change, there are two main driving factors. The first is the desire to change. Uh, people want 
to change. And the other is obligatory, meaning some sort of law, government, rule, or SOP. Uh, I think it's kind of funny in uh, the fire service and public safety as a whole, uh, they say you haven't hit the pinnacle of your career till you have a, an SOP named after you. Uh, in essence, that's a bad joke of saying, okay, somebody screwed up, and because somebody screwed up or something happened, then uh, you have a change in the way things are done. So leadership is going to control the atmosphere with this change and really with any change it's human nature again to resist change again especially in the fire service so you want them to have that desire to change so in order to get that desire to change you need to explain why we are changing and explain that hey we're doing this because it's safer or it's going to benefit us in the long run or it'll help um uh, you guys out and doing your job. So whether it's a desire to change or an obligatory change, the leadership has to promote it in such a way as it is a good thing and minimize that resistance that you're going to have from the rank and file. In the next section, Leadership During Change, we're going to look at four distinct areas. And the four main causes of change are economic, social, political, and technological impacts. So let's talk about the first section, an economic impact. And I think this slide is a little bit dated because the economy has turned around a little bit, but um, when you're looking at funding, we get our funding through tax dollars. And that's how we gain equipment and manpower. And since the Great Depression, moving forward, we've been steadily growing in that aspect. And, you know, we would just use the old explanation of, well, houses are going to burn and, and people are going to die and unless we get new fire trucks and stations and uh, most of the time our political leaders were happy to uh, commandeer and, and give us some measure toward getting the new stuff make accommodations that is well unfortunately when the economy began to tank uh, the funding started to dry up and you should be able to see this on the horizon especially uh, in the fire service since most of the time our funding comes directly from tax dollars so as you see people getting laid off and property values plummeting you know in the next year or two the, the trickle down effect is going to hit you and you're going to have to start tightening um, your belt so to speak and in order to get that new fire truck and that new equipment you're going to need to be a good effective leader and justify why you need it and that's when record keeping uh, record keeping comes into play and as members of the fire service, we need to justify uh, why are we spending money on on what and when and where. And, and hopefully safety doesn't get cut, but it always seems that training and safety always get cuts back in terms of funding when the economy goes south. Now, we are starting to come out of this uh, recession, if you will, and funding is again starting to flow back to the fire service and we are slowly beginning to transition and getting caught up on uh, all the maintenance and things that were put off for several years and new stations and equipment due to the economic shortfall so it's up to the leadership to really maintain a good uh, ebb and flow with the rank and file and explain that hey you know we're broke because of the economy and this is why we're having to do uh, more with less or, or everything with nothing, as I like to say. Social impacts play a big time role. Basically, the neighborhoods, um, the people we serve, our community, um, they can flex their political muscle, if you will, and force administration and elected officials to make change in whatever they deem uh, important whether it be fire service, police service, equipment, or protections. 
And if we also look at other social impacts within our organization, such things as hiring practices, cultural diversity, educational level of new hires, and generational differences all come into play into the uh, social mindset. So, for example, you may have cultural diversity in the fact of uh, one ethnicity in the neighborhood versus another within the department and the desire to have the department look more like the community it serves could be an issue. Um, hiring practices in terms of physical fitness and, and what you want to do there. And I like to hit on the uh, two at the bottom right quick in terms of ed educational levels of new hires and generational differences. And those kind of go hand in hand. If we look at people that are entering the fire service now, and you may be one of them, or you may be in charge of leading or managing uh, these individuals, you got to understand that it's a different mindset, a different generation. They have different life experiences that have molded. Uh, their personality and expectations. Um, so we look at educational of new hires. A lot of times these folks have come from a generation where their parents and grandparents said, hey, you know, I don't care what you do. You're going to go to college. You're going to get some degree or social degree or some form of higher education um, so you can be better off and advance yourself better than what they did. And these people go to school and they get a degree just because it was expected and they've been told that from birth. So the educational level there is higher than the current administration, which can cause uh, a rip between middle management and these new people coming in. You also have, as I said, generational differences. Um, with that, you have different mentalities toward... Uh, trends and learning techniques and desire you know between generation uh say uh millennials and generation xers or generation y or even our traditionalists uh everybody looks at things a little bit different so it's a good idea in leadership or middle management to keep these differences in mind when enacting change and to me that goes back to we're enacting change this is why and have that buy-in from all groups political impacts that's the big one where you know local state and federal leaders come down and say hey uh, there's new laws or standards um, funding at state and local levels and relationship with political leaders and the political climate enact change essentially so whatever the winds of politics blow will dictate what we get and do a great example of that now is the cancer bill that passed in the state of georgia where all firefighters whether it be volunteer or full-time um, that municipality is now charged with an unfunded mandate of providing uh, insurance, if you will, to help subsidize firefighters that gain cancer in the line of duty uh, in our cancer period, which just due to our profession, we have a high number of um, individuals that are diagnosed with cancer, and we can go into that later on some of our health issues. But that's good, uh, you know, a good example of political change and an unfunded mandate that means that governments have to pay for it in regard of what else they pay for. So they may cut training budgets or operational budgets or say raises in order to make sure that the uh, cancer premiums are met. Technology is another great impact and new technology is always coming out. So that's going to change rules and standards. Uh, a great example would be, look at a thermal imaging camera. That is a piece of technology whose price has come down tremendously and now is as something standard on fire trucks as, say, fire hoses, where in the past there may have been only, say, one or two per department. And the advantages of a thermal imaging camera 
do great in the sense that it helps with search and rescue, finding victims, hidden fires. And even with technology today, uh, you look at the case of uh, ultra high pressure systems, which again is a great piece of technology that I think everybody in the fire department should have. It's used in conjunction with it <coughs> to help fight and put fires out from uh, an exterior perspective. And again, making things safer for the firefighters on scene. As we talked about earlier, it's human nature to resist change. So one of the most critical components of effective leadership is to anticipate and react to that resistance. And in, in, in uh, essence, you know, nip it in the bud uh, before it becomes an issue. Resistance to change sometimes surfaces as a bad habit, uh, which take commitment and time to change. So, for example, uh, a bad habit like uh, in the text they talk about a new lieutenant that takes over an engine company or a uh, ladder company. Um, they're learning the job the equipment in the territory. They notice that the firefighter riding backwards has the irons, which is a halligan and an axe, on the floor by them. Well, the officer brings up the fact that, hey, um, that's not exactly safe because if we get in an accident, then that would become a missile or projectile. And the firefighter responds, hey, you know, it, it saves me time. It allows me to force the door before the engine company needs it, uh, etc. And, you know, they teach you in recruit school. I've been doing it for years. It hasn't been an issue, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it takes the officer's commitment to, in time to break people out of these bad habits and start instituting change. And that could be something simple as getting with the training staff and explaining the safety issues and again moving forward. So now we're starting with a new generation that are more safety minded. So the problem will get corrected uh, eventually by uh, a change in behavior or by uh, attrition. So let's look at some of the re reasons for resistance. It's the mentality of, hey, there's no need for change. We've been doing this way for 100 years and it works just fine. Loss of control. Hey, I don't want to lose my, my little bit of control. This is something I have control over and you're not taking it away from me. You have the ever popular closed minded people that won't listen to science and change. You have the resistance to learning, the connection with the old way and the people who did it that way. Again, hey, it's been tradition for 500 years. We're going to keep doing it and we're not going to be impeded by progress. And there's no role models for the new way. Hey, this is new. This is great. Um, and people aren't jumping on the bandwagon because they don't see that leadership or people in authority doing that new way or task. And another can be plain and simple. You know what? It is just too darn overwhelming. We just, you know, I can't deal with it with everything else. And they've had bad experiences in the past with change. So as a leader, whether it be the fire chief or at the lieutenant level or even at the driver level, you need to keep these in mind when new policies are enacted and think of ways to minimize um, these issues or essentially nip them in the bud. Opportunities for change. If we look at the history in the fire service, change comes in waves and there always seems that there's a, a new um, buzz word, letter or trend that uh, is coming around and as an organization you can choose either a to get on top and ride the wave or b let it pass you by and a lot of times if you let it pass you by you're going to play heck trying to get caught up so in the 70s the first big wave was ems that fire services uh, were getting an emergency medical service business they were either responding to ems calls providing BLS, ALS care, or even transport uh, capabilities. And those leaders that embraced this trend uh, really 
got ahead of the game in terms of manpower, equipment, and stations. And a good example of that is Henry County. The Henry County Fire Chief in the 1970s did a great job um, jumping on this wave and riding it. So what he did basically was get more ambulances and more stations first than fire trucks. So he sold it to the commissioners in the community saying, okay, uh, we're offering ambulance service. And in this area in the county, the rule, if something happens, it's going to take us uh, an X amount of time for the closest ambulance to get there. And if that ambulance is out on a call, then the next closest would be, you know, exponentially greater. So looking at that, looking at the charts, looking at the um, cost, he was able to sell a bill of goods where they built fire stations in these rural areas and only staffed them with ambulances first. And then eventually got to move in the fire trucks as well as, um, you know, your engine crews and ladders and so forth. So by having that infrastructure in place first, they were able to grow and grow effectively. And they did it all while riding the wave and providing more services. So that's a good example. In the 1980s, hey, it was hazmat. 1990s, technical rescue and public education. In 2000, it's terrorism and safety initiatives. You know, Homeland Security, emergency management, we got to be ready for the dirty bombs, the next big terrorist threat. And then in the 2010 uh, era is when, oh, sorry, budget cuts, we're broke. And uh, things started to uh, downgrade, or uh, I had used the term go in the toilet. And, you know, the question is, what about safety culture? You know, um, that's something that started rearing its head. So going forward now, are we going to jump on the wave and embrace it? and try to reduce that whole line of duty death as well as unhealthy habits and injuries uh, from unsafety practices. So when does a safety culture exist in an organization? And it's very easy to apply lip service to that saying, oh, we have a safety culture, we have a safety culture, safety and everything, blah, blah, blah. But researchers have identified five things that are present when there is a true safety culture within an organization. One being an organizational commitment, meaning the organization as a whole has made that a priority, whether it be a mission statement, um, a policy, a value, a, 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 a control, have you or an SOP. They are committed in doing what it takes to make sure safety is very important to the organization. Then you have management involvement, meaning not only the organization or the boss as a whole, but management really gets behind this safety culture and they do what they can to, you know, enforce the safety rules and and institute change within the organization to make sure that things are done uh, safely. And then you have employee empowerment and you empower the employee to point out things that may be unsafe and, and to change things and do what's right without fear of a reprisal saying, hey, um, this isn't safe. And, and they call somebody out on it and they don't have to worry about them being, um, say, written up or uh, reprimanded. And then, of course, some sort of reward system in place and a reporting system, uh, meaning, hey, um, this was something that was a safety issue that we identified. This is something we're working on. That way, uh, you have other people aware of said issue, and they're not going to be blindsided by it or um, basically trying to reinvent the wheel. The National Construction Agenda for Occupational Safety and Health established a broad belief that prevention, control measures, and action are three specific ways to use culture to counter hazards of their job.
Fire service can take a lot of notes from the airline industry and how they have really transformed themselves from a lack of a safety culture to one, their primary goal is to deliver passengers safely uh, to their designation. And with that being said, you can kind of look at the, the management system in place of, okay, if anyone on the aircraft feels that it's unsafe, uh, they can, without fear of reprisal, say it's unsafe and the issue is addressed before the plane leaves the ground or either they don't fly. And that's really big in like, for example, your um, rescue helicopters, your, your life flights, Emory flight, or whatever the case, uh, you may want to call them these days. Um, they are given a job, so to speak. They say, hey, we've got a scene call at this location. And then everyone on that helicopter from the pilot to the paramedic nurse have to sign up saying, hey, we're good to go to fly. And if for at any reason no one wants to fly, whether it be a bad feeling, the hair on the back of their neck is standing up, or they feel that the weather is an issue, then they're not going to fly. And that's a great culture to have in, in focusing on safety. So here's some great tips. Take it for what it is. If the alarm says there's a problem, believe it. If the engine light is on, don't risk it. Believe it until proven otherwise. Make it a line level effort, meaning have the rank and file just jump in with both feet and empower them to do the right job. Although safety cultures require managed involvement, a conscious decision to implement safety can be achieved at any level, and empowering that person at the bottom to do it will create a lifelong trend where as they progress through your organization, safety is going to still be there at every level, and then they're going to impart that on the people underneath them so that safety culture has sustainability. And of course, communication. Always communicate. Communicate is just the vein of getting the job done. And one of the issues that many times lead to an unsuccessful senior situation is the lack of effective communication. Communicate safety concerns during near misses is an excellent way to start the process. So as a training aid, look up near miss reports. Discuss them as a training evolution. Find out where people had made a mistake and learn from it so that that mistake doesn't happen to you and your people. Make the change easy. It has a lot better success if it's something that requires minimal effort. Break it down into small manageable steps, ultimately leading to an end goal. So for example, let's say you want your department to improve the overall health and wellness. So at the end of the day, so to speak, you want them to be able to do a physical agility test in a certain amount of time. Now, we all know sitting around the fire station, we have individuals that are a little less um, in shape than others. And maybe they've been there for a minute and they've got uh, up to the station weight and gotten a little um, out of shape. So instead of saying, OK, you got to be ready next week to do this physical agility test, start it slowly, requiring everybody to do, say, uh, 30 minutes of PT a day or a shift or 30 minutes of walking or whatever the case may be, and slowly bring them up to where they need to be, thus instituting the change, making it easy. And we're doing it in several little steps. And of course, get the bosses on board. You get the boss on board, you're going to have a better chance of making it happen and making it stick. The first step in any change for culture of safety is identify what culture you currently have within your department. By identifying what attributes we have, we can identify what we want to keep and what we want to change. 
Uh, the example in the test is talking about one attribute of a volunteer organization that, hey, that uh, response time is better if it's low. So you have drivers, you know, driving like bats out of hell, and they're having stories around the uh, coffee table of, oh, hey, you know, uh, I made it to this scene over on Jim Bob's Road in two minutes, and you know, unless they get a time machine or that secret, you know, uh, red button that propels them through space and time, uh, it's never going to happen. So that's an example of a, a culture change that needs to be addressed and get rid of, saying, yep, yeah, response time is good, but it's not the end-all be-all. Our, our focus should be on getting there safely and then doing our job and maybe have stories of how they drove safely or prevented it. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me accidents or whatever the case may be making your change it's important that we type in uh, tap into some of our assets the brotherhood the apparatus the uniform fire station shop and the hero uh, complex that uh, we, we may have in being a advocate in inducing change so looking at some of the components of a safety culture when the U.S. Navy began designing nuclear-powered vessels, it adopted a safety culture based on a no-fault management supervisor responsibility and employee responsibility system. NFM, the no-fault management, is based on the premise that management is responsible for both the success and the failure of the organization. The supervisor responsibility is eliminating in problem filtering. One of the main roles of a supervisor is to ensure that the problems that do occur are not filtered, meaning problem filtering occurs when contributing factors are covered up in an effort to hide minor mistakes or procedures. Eliminating problem filtering is a way to ensure that all the contributing factors are identified so we can properly remove them. One serious safety concern over the past several years has been a reduction in staffing. And everyday decisions by company officers can be made to clear such safety obstacles as um, staffing. So remove the barriers so the folks can do their job. Um, up your minimum staffing, do what needs to be done, maybe um, limiting the number of vacation or Kelly days or trying to hire more people, or I hate to say it, but maybe shutting an engine down so you have the minimum three or four to a unit. The final element is employee responsibility for safety culture. They must learn every component of the job and be safely when they do it. Have mentoring programs in place. By managing up someone with an experienced, knowledgeable person that has a strong desire to learn, they can help each other and become more safety conscious at their job. Bank safety is certification level. From awareness to operations to technician. We have levels in everything in the fire service from hazmat to firefighter, so why not do it for safety? And then have it breaking down such as awareness level is an introductory level that identifies basic principles and risk. The operation level is a standard by which all fire and EMT should be trained. And then the technician level is the highest level of safety and become proficient in setting up some sort of safety system. So the final aspect in the safety culture is cultural compliance, basically meaning that, hey, this is now something that's done and it's part of our culture that we do on a daily basis. Do something because you can't imagine not doing it that way. For example, like washing your hands before you eat or putting on your turnout gear before running into a fire. Institute of Safety Culture in Fire and Emergency Service is possible, taking the right steps. 
and maintaining that culture is not an option. Be an advocate for safety. Make sure that what you're doing now that's not safe is changed. So in conclusion, defining a cultural change for safety is vital. Emergency service organizations must adopt a safety culture. We need to make safety a priority. In summary, we have the bullet points listed. So, again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or call me in the office at 706-357-0162 or look in Blackboard Collaborate under the calendar for virtual office hours where we can get together in Blackboard Collaborate and talk about any questions or issues. Don't forget the review exercises for this chapter as well as the additional um, interactive course where you'll have to set up an account at the Life Safety Initiative website, Learning Network. Thank you and have a good day.